All right. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, whatever the correct greeting of the day is where you are. I know this is an unusual day and time, but I'm glad uh, all of you who are attending were able to join us. And thank you, obviously, also to Chadash for uh, taking time on a Sunday, uh, for him, a Sunday afternoon to uh, answer your questions. Yeah, it's a so for those for of you who have been here before, you know, I don't like to waste time with uh, any sort of chit chat or hi in Qatar and hi in Dubai, whatever. Let's just jump right into it. I will do a very rapid fire introduction of the ICCP for anyone who is joining us for the first time. And then I'll hand over to Chadash who will answer the questions we received in advance. And then uh, time permitting, we will answer additional questions. All right, uh, let's get started. Who are we? What are we? What do we do? Why should you join? The ICCP is a professional members organization that exists to recognize those with the skills, qualifications, and expertise in the professional management of construction claims. We have three main objectives, to establish international professional standards, to give recognition to those who have gained the appropriate knowledge and skills, and to help educate those who wish to gain the knowledge, experience, and skills in the professional management of claims. So why is there the need for the ICCP when there are so many other construction organizations? Well, quite simply, construction claims have become a key part of the construction industry. And the people who work in claims come from a broad variety of backgrounds, engineering, quantity surveying, project management, and um, obviously contract management. So uh, until now, there has not been an institute that specifically recognizes those who have the specialist knowledge, experience, and skills to be able to manage, prepare, and respond to claims to the highest levels of professionalism. Okay, so I will briefly introduce our steering committee. We have our executive officer, Andy Hewitt, our current elected president, Paul Gibbons, and three elected fellows, one of whom you may recognize as Chadash, who will be answering your questions today. Uh, Nina is the general manager. She is currently on maternity leave and I am filling in for her. And in terms of membership, I will not go into great detail as all this information is available on the website. I will say that we have three main levels of individual membership, which each has their own set of requirements. We also have introduced a student level of membership for those who are studying for a degree in the construction industry and student members can graduate and become graduate members as they work on their claims experience to become an associate and then a member and then a fellow. Okay, we also have a corporate level of membership for companies that specialize in claims or have departments that specialize in claims. Okay, and what is in it for the members? Why should someone join the ICCP? Well, we have uh, a private members area of our website that has uh, a knowledge bank of articles, white papers, research, case studies, et cetera, on contracts and claims topics. We have um, a database of further education and training, whether that's at the university level or more short term. We have a bookshop which does not sell books, but it does have reviews on the latest industry releases. We have a growing library of templates to help save our members time and ensure that their claims are to the highest standard. We have regular CPD opportunities such as this one. So for example, all members in attendance today will receive one hour of CPD. We have the ICCP Academy, which are more technical training sessions, which are available to members only. We have um, savings on books and further training. And I need to update this because um, just uh, day before yesterday, Rutledge changed their discount from 15% to 20%. And uh, you can also get 10% savings on all 
claims class courses. They are our training partner. We have a monthly newsletter to keep members up to date on what's going on within the ICCP as well as the industry. Uh, we offer industry exposure in, the ter in terms of having a public listing of members. All members receive their designation certificate and logos. We have a private LinkedIn group where members can discuss their contracts and claims questions so they don't have to wait for a uh, construction clinic. We also have the optional benefit of the Register of Claims Practitioners where um, generally speaking consultants and other members can privately list their um, skills and services on their individual web pages. And if that was too fast for you and you would like to know more, please either have a look at our website, institutecp.com, email me, jennifer.smith at institutecp.com or membership at institutecp.com. And finally, if you asked for further information when you registered, I will be in touch with you directly after this. And so you don't need to do anything. And with that whirlwind tour of the ICCP, I will hand this over to Chadash. I can stop sharing my screen. There we go. Okay. All right. Just a second. Uh, you can see it now, right? Yes. Okay. Okay, guys, thank you all for joining. And uh, I can see there's a, uh, uh, there's a great, uh, uh, I think I, there are 27 participants right now. And thank you very much for spending your time uh, on a Sunday uh, afternoon. My name is Chada Shevran Bayrak, and I have all these credentials. And um, um, recently I have been appointed as a FIDIC adjudicator. Uh, FIDIC educator is basically an educator who is approved uh, by the FIDIC president and uh, 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 who, who takes place in the approved uh, um, uh, adjudicators. So um, um, that's, uh, that's recent stuff for me. Uh, we had several questions before and um, uh, some of which relate to similar topics. So, um, but I will go one by one. And um, and uh, I will revisit the questions if, if necessary because as I said, some of, some of the questions are really uh, are linked to each other. So the first question is um, this relates to FIDIC ninety nine, and uh, uh, it's about sub clause twelve point three. It says it allows the contractor to ask for a new rate if following three conditions are satisfied. Uh, uh, the work is instructed under subclause 13, no rate or price specified in the contract and no specified, specified rate or price is appropriate. I have two questions on this. The conditions mentioned under two and three, both of them cannot be satisfied at the same time. Either two or three can be satisfied at the time because two says there is no rate, while three says there is a rate but not appropriate. In that case, we cannot fulfill all three conditions at a time. Please explain. My understanding is correct. And there's another question. Can the increase in material price be considered as a reason for specified trade in the contract is not appropriate? So um, uh, item three here. Um, the subclause verbatim states as follows. In order for the contractor to be entitled for a new rate, um, the work should be instructed under clause 13, no rate or price is specified in the contract and no specified rate or price is appropriate because the item, item of work is not of, of similar character or is not executed under similar conditions in the item in the contract. Um, to, to be honest with you, that's, uh, to me, that's pretty much straightforward because um, it says, among other things, the contract is entitled to ask for a new unit rate, uh, provided that it should be the, the 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 work should be instructed, the work should be should constitute a variation, and there should be no rate for the in the contract in the BOQ for this item, and there is no appropriate or similar rate either. 
Um, by way of example, um, suppose that there is a, 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 a there is a BOQ line item for for a painting job, and it refers to only workmanship angle of the painting painting of a you know regular wall. Um, and if the type of paint uh, 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 changes or additional paint, additional type of paint for additional areas or whatever are instructed by, by a way of variation, then sensibly the engineer can use an existing rate, existing rate in the contract. Yes, there may be no uh, 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 rate in the contract for that exact work, but there may be a reasonably similar uh, 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 rate in the contract, so he can use this. Therefore, uh, one and uh, two and three can uh, can happen at the same time. So, I, in my opinion, this is, this is pretty straightforward. The work has to be instructed; uh, uh, should be uh, should constitute a variation. There should be nothing in the contract uh, in relation to the work. Nothing, as in identical, uh, 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 defining the identical scope, or there's nothing similar either. In that case, the contractor is entitled to ask for a new rate. Otherwise, the, con the, the, the engineer can refer to the existing or the similar ones. So this is straightforward. Uh, B, uh, going back to the question, can the increase in material price be considered as a reason for specified rate in the contract is not appropriate? Well, it, it, it depends on the nature of the contract um, uh, and the applicable law, big time. And I will, I will explain uh, on this one a little further because as I said, some, some, some questions relate to uh, this point and, uh, and uh, uh, from different perspectives, but actually they, uh, they are asking the same thing. Um, if it's a lump sum contract or if uh, the works in question or the rates uh, uh, in question are not subject to fluctuation, escalation, and fixed, then I would say no. What do I mean by that? Because uh, you guys need to bear in mind that the contractor's commitment in the first place is not only execution of the works. It is also execution of the varied works, change works, in accordance with the mechanism set forth in the contract. So you're not just promising to do the original scope of works, you are also promising that there may be additional works and these additional works will be paid based on the mechanism stated, already stated in the contract. So if these rates are fixed, uh, and if we're talking about the fixed price, uh, lump sum firm price contract, then uh, uh, I'd say no. Uh, that being said, that being said, and I, and I will uh, I will try to uh, elaborate on that one later. Um, there may be instances where the contractor may may uh, uh, have a valid argument, and nevertheless, it's always good to bring this to the engineer's attention because um, uh, uh, contractual contractual entitlement is yes is very important. It's uh, it's it's, it's uh, what we have to. Um, uh, to focus on, uh, uh, but at the same time, the 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 employer, especially they they don't want to be completely unresponsive to the contractors' problems, which may have a negative impact on the works. So it's always it's always a good practice to bring this to the engineer's attention and see what will happen. But from a purely contractual perspective, I would say uh, no. I mean, depending on the, of course, uh, the specifics of the contract and the applicable law. Second question, what's the meaning of SAPCO's 1.7 assignments in FIDIC 99? Can the employer assign a portion of the contract to another party subcontractor with, 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 with the consent of the other party with new rates if the main contract is delaying some items under this sub clause? Um, how uh, FIDI contracts deal with assignment is uh, sometimes criticized and, and, and uh, it seems that they haven't changed uh, their approach in FIDI uh, uh, 17 suite either. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering why, to be honest, I, mean, um, I, I cannot think of uh, a good reason why, uh, why they didn't do that. But anyway, uh, how FIDI contracts deal with assignment is <clears throat> 
this clause, neither party shall assign the whole or any part of the contract, comma, and there should have been a comma here, or any benefit or interest in or under the contract. Why there should be a comma? Because these actually refer to different things, different principles. This part refers to novation. Novation, especially in common law, means transfer of an obligation as well as the benefits under a contract. The, the novation means transfer of the obligation as well. This is clearly uh, uh, separated, uh, as I said, especially in common law. And I think uh, uh, this is the universal approach as well uh, for this one. Whereas the, the, the transfer of uh, a benefit or interest on the contract is usually, usually called assignment, as you know. So uh, FIDIC uh, subclause 1.7 deals with, as I said, novation, assignment in the same clause, in the same sentence. Actually, these are different uh, uh, things. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and sometimes, I'm going to keep it short, but sometimes uh, uh, there, are, there, are some, uh, there may be some real side effects, you know. But um, for the purposes of this question, um, can the employer assign a portion of the contract to another party with the consent of the other party? Yes. It says neither party shall assign the, the, the. However, either party may assign the whole or any part. Of part. This relates to uh, uh, novation with the prior agreement of the other party at the sole discretion of such other party and may execute in favor of the bank or financial institution assign its right to any monies due or become due under the contract. B is purely assignment, assignment of benefit, and A relates to no wage. But can A be done with the consent of the other party? Yes. So if both parties agree for another reason, for whatever reason, uh, the contractor is delaying, the contractor is not experienced or whatever, but as long as both parties agree, uh, uh, certain parts of the works can be novated off to another party. But my recommendation here would be, guys, um, it's it's usually not enough to agree mutually agree that certain works will be novated off. But the finance financial consequences, everything in relation to money, should also be dealt with uh, uh, upfront. Because I I came across myself. Uh, some dispute in relation to the financial or commercial consequences of novation. So you have to agree in principle, yes, that's okay. It's, 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 it's a win-win situation if you bring someone else, but you have to also agree how to pay this guy and what to deduct from the existing contract and so on and so forth. Uh, but can it be done? Yes. Question three, when the contract period is extended, Due to employer's delay, can the contractor ask for new rates for the remaining works of the original scope on the grounds that his rates were valid only for the original contract period? If yes, under which clause applicable? Uh, this, this is somewhat related to uh, the, uh, the second question, or I mean, uh, part B of the first question. And the answer. Uh, the, the, the first question, if you recall, was can the rates change based on this and that reason? So this is, this is, this is a similar approach. Can the rates change? Uh, the previous one was relating to variation. This is relating to an employer delay event. So if the delay was attributable to the employer, can I say as the contractor or can the contractor say that my rates are no longer valid and uh, I need new rates and so on and so forth. I would say no. Again, it depends on the, 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 the specific conditions, the particular conditions of the contract and the applicable law. But uh, for, for uh, uh, let's say, for uh, the default position of, of free contracts or similar uh, standard for contracts is, um, is uh, well, let me give you this example. This a, a construction contract is nothing but uh, allocation of risks and rewards, uh, and this is something uh, which uh, a UK judge said. I think. Um, so, at the outset of the project, both parties are allocating risks, and 
assuming certain risks when signing the contract. What does it mean? So the, the contractor, as an experienced contractor who knows what's going on, accepts that if certain events attributable to the employer or neutral events happen, he will be entitled to an extension of time. And sometimes he will be entitled to extension of time and cost and profit following certain mechanisms set, set, forth, in, set forth in the contract. I mean, this delay event being attributable to the, uh, to the employer does not give the right to the contractor to challenge these rates which he, priced or he, which he provided in the first place. Because he already committed that, okay, I'm assuming certain risks. For example, um, delay caused by authorities. Delay caused by authorities is not my risk. And if this happens, uh, uh, as per the, uh, the clause in the contract, I will be entitled to relief. I will be entitled to EOT. I will be entitled to for other uh, clauses, uh, cost and profit. So when this comes into, into picture, um, um, the, 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 the mere reason that the delay is attributable to the employer or to another authority is not grounds for these rates to change. So this is what I'm trying to say. Uh, uh, um, uh, but that said, and, and this is something I've done in the past, but that was for prices, not for rates. Uh, that was for a specific price or, 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 or group of prices. There may be a certain flexibility there because after all, you can claim additional costs. So um, certain costs may be introduced not by way of fluctuation or increment or escalation, but by way of other things. And I'm not talking about changes in legislation or something like that. What do I mean? Um, a new cost which may relate to uh, the, the market practices, in my opinion, can be claimed uh, in, in such an EOT claim. Why? Because you committed, you promised, in my opinion, that, okay, if there's an extension of time, I will use my own rates and prices, but this was not my price in the first place. And this doesn't necessarily be need to be attributable to a change in law or anything. No, it may be a, it may be a market situation, which did not exist at the time of entering into the contract. So in my opinion, there's a certain flexibility here, but can I have new rates and are my rates not applicable anymore? Because as you know, your rates are, uh, your rates are applicable because you promised and, and, this is what you guys need, need to bear in mind. Your promise, your commitment is not only doing the works, is also doing the variations based on the mechanism state and contract. Yeah. And anyway, as I said, uh, there's no harm in bring this, bringing this to the engineer's attention because especially the clients, the employers, they, um, they always want to listen to their contractor if, uh, if there's something which is likely to um, to have a negative impact on the project. Can the contractor ask for new rates for imported goods due to currency fluctuations? See, so uh, the first question was, can I change the rates or are, can I say my rates are no longer applicable because it's a variation? The second question, I mean, the, the one I, I was just talking about, can I change the rates if the EOT is attributable to an employer risk one? And this question is, can I ask for new rates uh, due to currency fluctuations? And my answer would be similar. No, if there is no special provision in this regard and you need to look at the, the, the currencies of payment, uh, the, the, the currencies of payment clause and contract. Um, if especially if there are multiple currencies, then you need to set out very clearly how the, the local currency portion of the contract contract price will be paid. And this happened to me in one of the projects in uh, Sudan. Uh, uh, 
uh, and we, we were supposed to pay, uh, I think, 20%, 30% contract price in local currency and the 70% or the 80% in United States dollars. And because the thing is, if you use the, um, uh, the, the currency rate of the central bank, it's, it's basically unrealistic. I mean, if you want to buy dollars in the streets, you have to pay like three times more. So uh, the contractor raised the claim in this regard. They said, okay, you are paying me 30% of the contract price every month using the rate, yes, the central bank, but uh, the central bank rate uh, is not realistic and I cannot do this and, uh, and so forth. And luckily for them in that contract, it didn't specifically say that we were bound by the the uh, the effect rate of the central bank of the country so therefore we 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 used our uh, um, we inter interpreted the contract in the contractor's favor and and we and we uh, played ball if you will uh, but if the contract for example specifically stated that um, it will be paid okay it will be paid in two currencies but the local currency will be calculated based on the the official central bank rate, then I would say no. You cannot ask for new rates for uh, for imported goods. However, as I said, you, you may there's no harm in bringing this to the guys. The thing is, there is no harm in airing your concerns or raising your voice. And uh, I'm talking as a, as a claims guy. This is a claims institute after all, and. Uh, uh, just don't exhaust or just don't give up because you you you, you don't find a specific clause in the contract no just 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 air your concerns uh, be assertive especially if you're right and then and, and see what what happens okay question five if a affiliate contract is lump sum can the contractor refuse an instruction for additional work because the rates, see, uh, this is also relating to works. The rates in the schedule of rates are too low. Sub clause 13.1, FIDIC, right, uh, right to vary, uh, 99. My understanding is that the contract can refuse the variation because the market conditions changed. And this is the clause. It says the contractor shall execute and be bound by each variation unless the contractor promptly gives notice to the engineer stating with supporting particulars that the contractor cannot readily obtain the goods required for the variation. Upon receiving this notice, the engineer shall cancel confirm a variation instruction. It doesn't say the contractor does not feel like obtaining the goods because, because uh, the prices are not uh, you know, uh, satisfying uh, to him anymore, no. So, uh, and after all, it was him who provided provided these rates in the schedule of rates during tender stage. So uh, just merely um, uh, his rates being low due to market conditions does not by itself, uh, you know, uh, grant entitlement to the contract for, for uh, changing the rates. Um, but that being said, I think we need to we need to uh, bear in mind the, the the reason of the increment. I mean, if the reason of the increment refers to or relates to um, an employer risk event, then everything changes. Not only the rates, the whole game changes. But we're talking about normal market conditions. So bear this in mind. Uh, uh, because I think a lot of these questions relate to the Felix, uh, sorry, the, the COVID situation. And I think now, because of the obvious inflation and uh, you know uh, the, the, the crazy, crazy market conditions, so a lot of rates or prices from three, four years back are not feasible anymore. That I understand, and that's a, that's a global problem. But from a from a mere contractual position, this is a risk which the contractor assumed when signing the contract. So if he's going to change, if he, if, or, or if he believes that his his own commitment from two years ago is no longer valid, he has to have very very strong grounds. Or let me give you give you this example. Suppose that, and this was the case. Do you guys remember, like four or five months ago, uh, one barrel Brent was twenty dollars or something. Now it's one hundred one hundred twenty. 
what if it was the other way around? I mean, the, the employer also can claim, right? We have close 2.5 and we have a whole new close in, in the 2017 suite. Suppose that the rates for fuel was 120 before and because of market conditions, again, this is very important, because of market you know, situations, it went down to 20. Would the, would the client, would the employer have the right to claim to reduce the contractor's uh, rates? No. This is assumption of the risk. But again, depending on the applic applicable law, and I will give some examples, and, and the specifics of the contract, that, that may be exceptions. But we're talking about the uh, 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 default uh, uh, position. Uh, yeah. OK. Um, the applicable law, uh, especially in the civil law countries, is, is very important because in the Gulf region, especially in the Gulf region, the civil codes of uh, of United Arab Emirates and, and, and Qatar and Kuwait are very similar, if not identical. Some codes are, are literally identical. Um, and uh, these civil code says, for example, Article 171 of the Qatar Civil Code says, if a party, the, if, if a party of the contract will incur exorbitant loss, then the whole game may change. What does it mean? Uh, 171 refers to Pactus Aseranda, which is a contract duly and properly concluded. The parties must be kept, and non fulfillment of the respective obligations is a breach of that contract. Such a contract may be revoked or altered by mutual consent of the parties or for reason provided by law. Where, however, as a result of exceptional and unforeseeable events, again, see, it all relates to the reason of the contract's claim for change, uh, contract's claim for, for changing the rates, for increasing the rates. What is the reason? If that reason, if the contractor can, can prove, can demonstrate that it was, a, it, it was a result of an exceptional and unforeseeable event, then the fulfillment of the contractual obligation, though not impossible, becomes excessively onerous in such a way as to threaten the obligor with exorbitant loss. So, uh, and this is, by the way, this, this is quite important because um, as I said in Gulf, uh, in, in, in the Gulf region, they have very similar uh, uh, articles in their civil codes. It doesn't say if the performance becomes, becomes impossible. In some jurisdictions, because in order for such thing to happen, the performance should be literally impossible. But here it doesn't say impossible. It says, as to threaten the obligor with exorbitant loss, the judge may, according to circumstances and after taking consideration interest of both parties, reduce the excessive obligation to a reasonable level. And this is very important. It says, any agreement to the contrary shall be void, which means this is a strict provision of Qatar civil code. It, it's an overriding uh, uh, a requirement and you cannot rule it out in your contract. Whatever your contract says, the, uh, uh, this this provision uh, still applies. So, if you can demonstrate that, um, and I think I, I will mention this in one of the, one of the uh, next questions, but uh, suppose that um, uh, there is a rate in the contract, or better, there is a rate in the provisional sums part of the contract, or like a day, day work item. And the quantity in relation to this item was very low in the beginning of the contract, or it was just a day work item, you know, with, with no quantities or, or with very little quantities. And the employer, based on this rate, issues a massive variation, a massive variation. If the contractor can demonstrate based on this clause that something happened and that something is exceptional and unforeseeable and 
because of that and because of this situation, if I carry out the works with that rate, I will incur exorbitant loss. In that case, that may be a valid claim. But that would be a claim under the law. Would it be under the contract? I don't think so. But anyway, this is something you need to bring to the engineer's attention. The engineer has, uh, especially the employer, has the, the authority to uh, to amend the contract if necessary or address these concerns as, 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 as long as they are valid uh, uh, concerns, you know, and well substantiated. Um, yeah, I think these are Simon's questions. Uh, Philly Grad Book 99, Variations and Claims. For a contractor's claim to be considered, how important is it for the contractor to clearly state the legal contractual basis of the claim, contractual extra contractual expressia? And 1A, how would the engineer respond to the claim if the contractor fails to be specific and doesn't clarify, confirm the provisions relied upon? Close this up with the question, five twenty, et cetera. Um, you guys are claimed uh, practitioners, of course, you, you, you know this very well, but just to recap, uh, a successful claim, because a claim after all is nothing but persuading the other side of the table. This other side of the table can be the client, can be the engineer, can be the educator, can be an arbitral tribunal or can be the judge himself. So you need to, uh, uh, introduce, you need to show that your argument is strong and you have to convince, you have to persuade the, the, the other guy. So when making a claim, of course, firstly, you need to follow the procedural requirements, which means you have to issue a timely notice. All of you guys are very well aware of this. You have to follow the submission procedures and so on and so forth. Can you reject a claim merely based on procedural requirements? Yes. Yes, you can. If the contractor or whomever follow the procedural requirements, then you look at the contractual and legal basis of the claim. Okay, this guy has followed the procedures very well, but he wants more money. Is he entitled to more money under his contract? So he has to demonstrate uh, the contractual and the legal basis of his claim. And I think it, 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 this part is what this question refers, refers to. How important is it for the contract to state legal contractual basis of the claim? It's very important. Without that, it's not a claim at all. And then factual grounds and causation, meaning, okay, I filed the procedures, I issued a notice on time, I did everything uh, you know, in a, in a timely manner and a proper manner, and I believe I'm entitled to extension of time, more money based on disclosing the contract. So I, I have everything uh, you know, uh, here. And these are the events or these are the circumstances which I believe uh, grant me entitled for additional uh, payment, additional uh, cost or extension of time. So you need to, or the claimer must demonstrate a solid link between the events and circumstances and the consequences which which, which grant him entitled entitlement to, to relief. It's also referred to as causation. So something happened, these are the this is the link of causation and therefore this occurred. Uh, please give me more money. Please give me more time. Uh, so as I said it's very important establishing the legal contractual basis of a claim is very important and uh, and the, the engineer may seem to reject the claim the claim is, is, is not uh, sufficient in this regard, or alternatively, they may uh, require the contractor to rectify and resubmit and give them another chance. That's also possible. The, the question is saying the contractor submitted a valid notice of claim for an employer delay event, but then continues to fail to submit a fully detailed claim within the pres prescribed period of 42 days or another period, is the employer entitled to claim delayed damages under SC 7.8, .8, delayed damages if the time for completion versus completion date is about to expire? Um, firstly, um, uh, not about to expire, but after expiration of the contract duration, yes, the contract, the employer may uh, uh, or will be entitled to uh, uh, 
delay damages. Uh, uh, because the EOT process is very straightforward, you have to make a proper claim. Fine, you issue the notice very well, but you have to issue a fully detailed claim file within 42 days. And especially if both parties agree to agree that agree that the detailed uh, claim submission will be made in say 100 days. If the contractor fails, then uh, easily the the employer will be entitled to. Uh, delay damages. But my recommendation would be um, if uh, this is a strong claim, uh, be more prudent. I mean, just just don't start deducting uh, you know, immediately. And anyway, you cannot do that. First and foremost, you have to raise a claim under 2.5 as the employer. You cannot just automatically deduct delay damages. You have you, you meaning employer has to make a claim under 2.5 uh, first, and the employer also has to follow the mechanism set for it in, uh, in 2.5. Uh, and presuming this is done, my recommendation would be don't start deducting right away. Establish the, uh, the, the employer's entitlement. Definitely put it in writing. Write them a, a letter saying that, Mr. Uh, contractor, this is the completion date. You have not completed uh, on time. And yes, you made a claim, but your claim remains uh, incomplete. Therefore, uh, the employer now is entitled to delay damages, whatever money per day or whatever it is. But deduction of the same, in my opinion, can be deferred. And this is this is my uh, you know uh, way of doing this. Uh, if there's a strong EOT claim, I wait. I wait uh, to see how it how it's resolved, but it's very unlikely, or there is no you to claim a such, then you can start deducting the delay damages right away. However, if any UT is likely to be granted the contract, then you more prudent to notify the employer's entitlement on the on, on supposed to 2.5 and start the actual deduction of the LADs from internal payments once the UT process is completed. You can do it at the end the statement at completion, you yeah. know. Are there any limitations, financial or otherwise, by which a variation may be instructed? What course of action is open to the engineer in the situation where the contract subcontract to first comply with the value instruction if it's not take away? Um, okay, so is the, are there any, any, any financial limitations by which a variation may be, may be instructed? Uh, yes, yes. Um, again, it depends on the the applicable law and the um, and the um, uh, the contract specifics. Um, um, and the and this and, and surrounding uh, regulations as well, especially when it comes to omissions, because you know a variation can be additional omission. So substantial omissions are always tricky in 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 pretty much all jurisdictions, especially in civil civil law jurisdictions, because the, the employer having an uncapped right, or let's say a theoretically uncapped right to omit the works may render the, the, the whole business unfeasible for the contract at, at some point. Um, what do I mean by that? I mean, if tomorrow, Instead of terminating terminating contract, if tomorrow the uh, the the employer issues an omission of fifty percent of the contract price, then the contract may may very well render unfeasible for the contract. In that case, uh, 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 there may be a strong uh, uh, argument in favor of the contractor. But again, this 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 uh, all depends on the applicable law. Or for example, if um, the employer is a governmental entity subject to the public procurement law because if you're if if your employer or if the employer is a government entity you are bound by the contract you are bound by the law which relates to the procurement of public uh, works and it relates to other laws uh, like the civil code and code of obligations and other uh, similar laws and in some countries, 
uh, this cap is introduced uh, 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 within the public procurement law. I mean, the contract may be signed in relation to uh, the cap for variations, but the public procurement law may have a cap in this regard. It may say any uh, uh, variation for, for additional works or omission of the works more than 20% of the original contract price is subject to this and that, or is uh, uh, is at the discretion of a party, or it, it cannot be done at all. So uh, 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 this is also something which uh, which you guys need to uh, uh, need to bear in mind. Or, for example, as you said, for omissions, uh, the contractor may automatically be entitled to loss of profit uh, in case of omission or in case of let's say substantial omissions and omission is also variation and and this is an actual example you have to act in civil law countries as i said before especially uh, act in good faith because just because if there's a 20 percent gap let's presume in the contract i mean the contract itself says uh, the variations can be maximum uh, uh, 20 percent of 20 percent of the contract price but if the employer issues a variation uh, which corresponds to 19.9999% of the contract price, but not 20%. This may be considered as not acting bona fide, not, not acting in good faith by the court and may be, uh, 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 may be amended or canceled altogether. Um, okay, so the... the the second question. What course of action is open to the engineer in the situation where the contract subcontract fails? Well, you don't have any course of action if the subcontract fails to comply. Uh, it's always the contractor. With a valid instruction and if you stand they undertake the way it works. Well, what happens, and this is, by the way, this is a, uh, this is this is a common question. I mean, what happens if the if the contractor just says, "Okay, I, I'm I'm not doing I'm not doing this job. I mean, this is a variation anyway. It's additional work, and I don't want to do it anyway." But that would be a breach of contract. I mean, it 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 has no difference than not fulfilling the let's say the original uh, obligation on this contract because his job, as I said at the beginning of this of the session, his job his promise is not only to build a building. His job is to build a building and any variations in accordance with the contract. This is his commitment. So as long as this, this mechanism is clear and there are no ifs and buts in relation to the application of the rates or whatever, he cannot just say, no, I'm not doing this. There are only a few exceptions in, in, in FIDIC books relating to, for example, health safety, relating to like literally, if something is impossible to obtain in the country, then yes, in in very rare circumstances, the 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 uh, the contractor may may reject the variation, but uh, he has to have very he has to have very strong grounds. And he if he doesn't, it's a breach of contract. So what do you do if the contract is in breach of contract? Among other things, again, uh, in short, you issue a notice to correct under fifteen point one. And if he, if he doesn't do that, you award the works to someone else and back charge to the contractor with your overheads on, overheads on top. Not profit, but with your overheads. And what does your mean? Uh, uh, if you have a consultant and if the, if the consultant has to work extra because the contractor is not doing his job, then you can claim that one. If you're supposed to re-tender or make a mini tender for uh, for certain parts of the works, that administration of the tender is again additional cost, which can be back charged to the contract. So, so uh, the bill may be very uh, very big for that one. Uh, and um, I have done this in the past, and the contractor was surprised and they challenged them. But at the end, uh, uh, that was the situation because this is your this is your job. If you don't do your job, then you have to. Uh, bear the consequences or ultimately termination of the contract. Dragesh says contractor doesn't submit the notice on time, but uh, still the claim is well under law. Well, that's a, that's a very long uh, subject, and uh, and uh, we we had a web webinar before in relation to time bars, 
uh, Rages, just have a look at that one because in some circumstances it may be valid in some circumstances but this, this is a very long subject um, so i'll just add in there that all of the previous webinars are available on yeah both our yeah. website and on our youtube channel our youtube channel is uh institute of construction claims practitioners so very easy to find okay Second question in two parts. Uh, from Mr. <laughs> Ahmed, Ahmed Bey. We had a case where the employee gave instruction to proceed with the variation, but the payment took considerable amount of time to get the board approval of the employer. The separate procedure was set in the project consistency without the time frame. Can the contract suspend the work? Use a non-payment despite the fact that the employer confirmed by the Okay, so I, I understand that uh, there was an instruction. The contractor started uh, doing the job. Uh, by the way, I'm having this problem here in Qatar as well, so I, I hear you very well. This and uh, the contract, I, I I I presume I understand from the premise of the question. The contract will start working on time. There's no time frame for uh, for uh, for variations. I mean, the, the, this this payment relation to where it works. Uh, can the contractor suspend the work because of non-payment? Well, so. There is no variation in place, but the contract is executing the varied work. So would he have a valid variation in place? So if this is an, if this, the additional works are introduced by means of an engineer instruction, and if it is clear from this instruction itself or from surrounding evidence that this instruction would constitute a variation and all everyone involved, both parties were all aware that this instruction would constitute a variation. In my opinion, even without a variation order form signed in place, the contractor is entitled to payment. And what happens if the contractor is not paid on time? Well, this is set out clearly in, 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 in all pretty much all standard form contracts. The contractor, first and foremost, would be automatically, without necessity of issuing a claim notice or whatever, would be entitled to uh, 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 finance financing charges, which is basically interest. And as I said, this is an automatic right. You don't need to raise a separate claim or make separate summaries. No, you just include in your payment application, time payment application, that this is uh, the delay and this is the uh, amount due. And the amount is calculated usually, uh, if I recall correctly, 3% above the discount rate of the um, of the uh, 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 central bank of the currency, the contract currency. So suppose if the contract is uh, is paid in United States dollars, Fed rate discount rate, I think is now 0.5% or something, you will claim or you will be automatically in, entitled to 3.5% annual interest in, in, in connection with delayed payments. Can the contractor suspend Yes, ultimately the suspension is there and it's it's written in the contract. Can the contractor suspend only varied works? Uh, I would say yes. I would say yes because uh, in case of a late payment, the contract does not limit uh, uh, the contractor's uh, position to suspend. I mean, it doesn't say you can suspend part of. No, it it gives the contract the right to suspend everything. So if the contract is not exercising his right, but partially, then it still is right, I would say. Second question is what happens if the employer, if the employer gives a direct instruction to the contractor, which is a certain variation, how the engineer shall act as per Fidic Yellow Book 99? He shall, he shall ask an approval of variation by the board as stated in the contract or just follow the instruction of the employee project manager. Okay, okay. Um, so I understand that your contract has particular conditions um, um, which introduce the, the, the board or tender committee or whatever's approval as a prerequisite of the variation. If that's the case, then we need to look at the particular conditions. I'm at pay. Uh, because there's no such thing in, in, in the forfeited books. If your contract has particular conditions which introduces the board approval or the tender committee approval or whatever 
you know, uh, uh, entity they are referring to, then it changes the whole variation mechanism under this contract. I mean, we need to we need to we need to look at the the particle condition itself. Um, because if your particular condition says no instruction, even constituting a variation, shall be valid or shall be payable unless the board's written approval, then it's another story. Then it's another story and we have, we, we need to see the, uh, uh, the, the actual, ah, yes, it's a particular function to get board approval. Yeah, it, does it say that without the board approval, the variation sh uh, shall not be considered and the contractor should not do the work and he will not be paid. So what was what, what, the specific uh, wording of that clause? Ahmed Bey. Shall continue the works, then, then you have to pay. You have to pay. Because you cannot just say, this is an instruction which clearly constitutes a variation because not every instruction constitutes a variation, but this is an instruction, definitely a variation. The variation is subject to the approval of the board and this guy, that guy, the contractor shall carry on with the works. The contractor shall not stop, but I will pay you whenever I feel like paying you. No. Uh, so yes, I would say the contractor had the original scope. Ah, well, uh, Ahmed Bey, as I said, it's because if the if the work work means original scope, then it doesn't then it doesn't specifically refer to variation. In that case, it's, it's a little bit complicated. But in my opinion, they have to pay anyway. Especially in a in a in a civil law country, you cannot play games. You know, you cannot just say, "Oh, Mr. Contractor, go to the work and play games uh, with regard to board approvals." And don't know, you have to you have to do it. Further to this is uh, Gamlat's question. Further to question eight answer: Can the part part of the works assigned to somebody else after issue notice to it? Yes, as long as both parties agree. It can be assigned. Yes. I have advised Ahmed Bey says I have advised the employer to pay as well since it's, it's interim. Yes, that's another thing. Uh, but still, yeah, this being this being interim doesn't mean that you can pay something which is not in the contract. Uh, payment of a variation does not justify payment for that particular month just because the amount paid, cumulative amount paid, would be less than the contract price. I, un I understood your point, but it's not entirely payment. The replay and slides uh, will be uh, posted in uh, the next couple of days on the website. And um, our next webinar will be on the FITIC Green Book, uh, an overview of 1999 and 2021 editions. That will be on August 18th at 9 a.m. GMT. Yeah with yep. Mansour Ali, sorry. Uh, he will be answering your questions and registration is open. Uh, so if you uh, do not get our newsletter, you should definitely subscribe. Um, and you guys, some of the questions are very difficult. So I'm, I, I requested additional support from uh, <laughs> a claims expert. Hello? Say hi, say hi. He's a, he's a claims expert. He gets whatever he wants immediately. Just I have one question regarding the omissions when an employee engineer of scope of work from a contract. Is it correct to take out the amount from the BOQ or take the actual cost as per the plans and drawings? Well, it depends on the on the contract itself, but I can say usually you should take the actual cost from the drawings. Uh, but again, you need to you need to read the contract as a whole because in some contracts you need to refer to the prior two documents as well. But usually, usually you need to consider the actual scope because in lump sum contracts, again, usually BOQs, uh, the, the quantities. I mean, uh, the 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 the, uh, uh, the quantities do not need to be accurate. So. Because it's a lump sum contract, that's rule. You're not paying, measuring and paying from a BOQ. You are paying a specific amount for certain works to be delivered at the end of the, the project duration. So generally speaking, uh, you need to look at the actuals. Joseph, so Deep Kumar. Yeah, 
Joseph says this less than love some complex. Yes, in my opinion, you have to refer to the actuals, no, no BOQs. BOQ, the thing is, BOQs are, are almost always confusing in love some complex, and I'm I, I'm reluctant to, to provide BOQs to be honest with you. And if you are going to provide BOQs, you have to you have to be sure the preambles or or or, or the the other parts of the contract should clearly set out the purpose of the BOQs and the usage of the BOQs because everybody has the misunderstanding that works are defined uh, in the BOQs. No, works are defined in the drawings and in the specifications. But as I said, you need to look at uh, the contract as a whole. You may need to look at the priority priority of documents. Uh, but usually this is the this is the case. If the contract is breached by a, this is a question from Deep Kumar. If the contract is breached by the employer, can the particular conditions be void for which the employer transfers the risk to the contractor, which are employer's risk based on normal FIDIC? And no, no. I mean, uh, a contract is a contract, and if the contract isn't it's, is uh, the employer is in breach of contract, then the remedies are different. I mean. Of course, you I, you need to look at the specifics of, 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 of this question of the actual circumstance. But in principle, if the country, if if either party is in breach, you need to again uh, consider this breach in accordance with the contract itself. You cannot just say just because of the breach, this and that are not valid. Anymore. No, you cannot do that. That being said, some clauses in the contracts may be, for example, illegal, and the the severability principle applies in such cases and yada yada but i don't think you are referring to such case so i would say uh, no you have to or the particular conditions won't be void another one from uh, nabushan nabushan uh, the contractor offer contains a discount on the entire price of his bid submitted is the discount automatically applicable variations no no uh, because and I'm presuming you're talking about post-contract. I mean, th there's an offer. The contractor provided the discount by means of percentage or by means of value for that particular offer. The offer was accepted. The contract, you know, was signed, executed, and so on and so forth. And you're suggesting, would this discount be applicable for variations as well? Well, uh, uh, it, it depends on how this discount was introduced. I mean. Uh, um, if this is a remeasurable contract, and if the contractor, if this is a remeasurable contract, suppose this is a remeasurable contract, uh, the contract price based on provision quantities which are subject to measurement is, let's say, 100 million. And the contractor introduced a, discount, a discount as percentage during tender. And this was uh, included in the contract documents and it's clear, but the rates were not amended. If the rates remain unamended, uh, even though the contractor provided this discount on a remeasurable contract, then yes, I would say the contract rates are the discounted rates, or should be the discounted rate, discount rates. But the contract administrator, before signing the, 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 the contract, should have amended the rates accordingly. If it is a lump sum contract and if the contractor introduced uh, a discount by means of percentage or by means of uh, uh, like a single amount, then I would say no. If you guys have questions, you can send, uh, send those across on my, uh, on my LinkedIn uh, account. Um, I, I think I'm, I'm already connected to many of you. And if you're not, you can just uh, just drop me a note on link, LinkedIn with your question. I, I, will try to, I will try to help you guys. And don't forget, members can uh, ask their questions in our exactly. private LinkedIn group exactly. anytime yeah. as well. Exactly. All right. So thank you, everyone, for attending on a Sunday. Uh, and uh, especially thank you, Charash, for... Uh, all of these answers and staying over time to my pleasure ma'am no problem i i wish my son was a little bit uh, in a in a better mood than uh, <laughs> but he's not so uh, so next time but still adorable 
<laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. And we'll see you in August. Enjoy your holidays in, uh, in July. All right. And Bye, guys. Thanks, Have everybody. a good one. All right. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye.